Welcome back. Hello, Veronica. Our next session is called Social Media Marketing in or During the New Abnormal. Maintaining and growing relationships with your audience is more important than ever, as you saw uh, from Colleen's data this morning. Organizations that stay digitally connected are far more likely to be successful now and on the other side of this crisis, and social media is clearly a key channel for this connection. Today, you'll hear from social media marketers across genres. This session is broken into four segments, uh, three organizational case studies, and then a group Q&A. First up, Michaela Brewster is the social media manager for Broadway Advocacy Coalition, an organization that uses the arts to make a lasting impact on policy issues, including criminal justice reform, education equity, and immigration. She leads the social media promotion of their Broadway for Black Lives Matter forums, where I first saw her work and was so incredibly impressed particularly with how she used Instagram to stoke evangelism. And you see, and I mentioned yesterday that we've even um, borrowed and modeled um, some of our Instagram around this conference based on what we learned from Michaela. So I'm so excited for Michaela to share her session with you. Welcome, Michaela. Hello, I'm so excited to be here. And so excited to hear that you used it. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, well, I'm going to hand it off to you. Please introduce yourself and take it away. All right. Yes. Hello. Um, my name is Michaela Brewster. My pronouns are she, her, hers. I'm a half black, half white female with very curly brown hair, and I'm wearing a green shirt. Um, I'd like to take this time to recognize that uh, I'm on stolen land that was forcefully taken from the Chidi Macha tribe in what is now New Orleans, Louisiana. Um, so I am actually now the communication director um, for Broadway Advocacy Coalition, um, whose logo I believe will show up on the screen soon. But um, yeah, I've been running their social media accounts since May of this year. And some of you may have heard of our event that we had back in June. It was called Broadway for Black Lives Matter again. Um, but Broadway Advocacy Coalition has actually been around since 2016. And it was founded by members of the Broadway community as a direct response to the nation's issues of racism and police brutality. So we're an organization that's made up of a diverse group of artists and advocates, with students and lawyers and directly affected leaders, and then marketers like myself. Um, so we, we have this term that we love to use called artivism. Uh, and we call ourselves artivists. Uh, this term is used to describe the space where we as an organization operate best, which is the intersection between art as this powerful storytelling tool and activism. So we see how difficult conversations can be introduced in an impactful way through art forms. And so we work to harness that tool uh, in our work towards an anti-racist theater community. Um, so since our inception, we've been really lucky to receive a lot of support from the industry. Uh, yes, up on the screen now, you can see some headlines from the last few months, um, some that promoted our previous events. Uh, we were really lucky to receive some donations from various organizations in the theater community. And then this summer, uh, we were so excited to be named on Variety's 2020 list of Broadway to Watch. So um, we had over 6,000 people attend live um, for our first event. And since then, the replay on YouTube has reached over 15,000 views, which we're super excited about. So in case you weren't able to join us, here's a clip of Britton Smith. He's the president and co-founder of Broadway Advocacy Coalition. And this was his introduction at the beginning of our first event uh, of this year, Broadway for Black Lives Matter again. Uh, my name is Britton Smith, and I am the president and co-founder of the Broadway Advocacy Coalition. I am humbled by this moment in our history that has brought us all together. Uh, this moment has forced us all to look at the oldest, ugliest actions and behaviors of racism within our community. It's forced us to say, enough, see us, we matter. We're usually in much smaller spaces together surrounding the work and the accomplishments of 
the make-believe that we create. Today, we are nearly 5,000 people gathered here to listen to reality. This is not a play designed to move you. This is not a set of monologues written to stir your beliefs, but this is a mirror. This is reality. This is an opportunity to look at ourselves and acknowledge the bullshit, the racism, and demand that it no longer be normalized. So um, it took a bit of work to get all of those members of the theater community to attend. Um, and so those tactics are what I'm going to be sharing about today. So um, obviously we've all been online a lot more since quarantine began. Um, I think back to the beginning of quarantine when I would log on to Instagram and my entire row of Instagram story circles were replaced by Instagram lives. Um, I'm sure a lot of you have that same <laughs> experience, but um, there's this outpouring of video content as we all look for new ways to connect with each other virtually, which is amazing, but that also means that audiences are oversaturated with options of things to watch. So with thousands of online events all happening at once, the question is how do you have yours stand out and have people tune in? So our approach was to apply word of mouth strategies to a digital platform. So 92% of consumers trust recommendations from other people, even if they don't know them personally, over promotional content that comes directly from brands. So um, it, it's the same reason why when we're headed to a new city, we ask a friend who's visited before for recommendations of places to see and, and things to eat. You know, we could just Google it, but we want someone to vouch for the experiences that we seek out. And as we all are very aware, um, people can outsmart even our best laid marketing plans. And people know when they're being sold to by a brand. So they want to know that something is worth the investment of their time and or money from a third party person who's not gaining or losing anything, no matter what decision they make. So with Broadway Ad Advocacy Coalition's first event of 2020 coming up, I collaborated with other members of the team to come up with a series of RSVP Instagram story graphics. So up on the screen, you can see the three graphics that we posted uh, a few days before the event began. The first one has our logo, the text, let us know you're coming, and then a series of instructions that I'm about to walk you through. So they say, number one, hold down a finger on the next two stories, and number two, screenshot. So in case you're unfamiliar, Instagram Stories has a feature where the imagery that goes on top of your content, like um, the person's profile picture, uh, the handle of the person who posted it, the lines that show you how many stories are left to watch, and the exit button, um, all of that disappears if you hold your finger down on the screen for a few seconds. So this allows people to screenshot whatever content you've posted in a clean way that makes it a lot prettier for them to repost it on their own story and it's not convoluted with all that other stuff um, on top of it. So then the next set of instructions say, number three, share to your story, and number four, tag us. So it's important to give people clear and specific instructions of how you want them to engage. Otherwise, it's a guessing game that you leave your audience to make the decision on. So for us, we wanted to leverage each of our followers' networks to spread the word about our event as much as possible. So essentially, we wanted to create a pool of micro-influencers within the theater community who would be able to spread the word to their friends and colleagues who are also in our target audience. So um, we also wanted to make sure that people had a way to connect with us once they were interested in attending and had heard about the event. So we made sure to clearly state that we wanted to be tagged, um, of, although of course not everyone tagged us, <laughs> but this allowed us to track approximately how many people had shared the graphic. Um, but then in case they didn't tag us, we put our hashtag on the graphic itself so that anyone who was interested in attending had a way to find us no matter what. So um, it's important to note as I move to these next two slides that this was a three day forum where we reserved one whole day just for members of the black theater community. So um, 
this space was intended for us to be in community with each other without the lens. Um, and the hope was to begin healing wounds caused by racism within the industry. Then the last two days were open to anyone and everyone in the national theater community. So not just Broadway, but anyone across the nation who works in theater. And this was a time of education on the issues um, by bringing up examples of some common microaggressions and racist interactions that people have had in the industry. And so we wanted to make sure to provide people with tools of how they could combat racism in the industry and then also within themselves. So the next two stories were our way of communicating the intention behind each of those days in the forums. So, um, the first one said, I'm ready to heal with my community on day one of Broadway for Black Lives Matter again. And then the second one said, I'm ready to listen and stay accountable on days two and three of Broadway for Black Lives Matter again. So these I statements are super impactful and they allow for people to connect more personally with the heart of the event. So we didn't ask them to just share boring information about yet another live event, um, but we made it like a, a declaration of their intentions. Um, and that also allowed them to kind of understand like what this event was going to be like. So we were able to set the stage and make it clear that we wanted our non-Black allies to enter this live stream from a place of listening and understanding um, rather than being on the defense. So giving people this language up front allowed people, um, allowed everyone to, to enter on the same page um, and to know what was expected as we offered this gift of information and um, as we shared personal experiences. So underneath those statements, we wrote dates and times of the events to make sure that anyone who saw the graphics on anyone's story had all the information that they needed. Um, you know, they had the name of the event and um, how they could find us and the, the time and date. So um, then, so by the time that our events began, we had around 950 followers on our account and 202 RSVP graphics were shared that we're aware of because not everyone tagged us again. Um, but taking the number of people involved and dividing that by our follower account at the time gave us around a 22% engagement rate. So we were thrilled by the response that we saw with this format of promoting the event. And it became clear that this method worked well with our audience. And so um, we, we saw that they were primed and ready to go and ready to do whatever they could for the cause. So um, as days two and three approached the forum, we decided to take it to the next level. So the next slide up on the screen um, shows three of the like screenshot and respond style graphics that we shared over the last two days of the forum. So the first story asks, um, during this day of listening, I learned blank about the black experience and I am keeping myself accountable by dot, dot, dot. The second story states, I believe an equitable and anti-racist theater landscape looks like dot, dot, dot. And then the third story says, in an effort to educate myself, I will, and then left blanks for people to fill in resources under watch and listen to and read. Now, um, we at Broadway Advocacy Coalition believe that being anti-racist is an active process that non-Black allies work on, you know, on a daily, weekly, monthly, yearly basis. So um, it's an ongoing process that no one graduates from. We all make mistakes and fall short in every other area of life. So of course that applies to racism too. So it's not a box to be checked where you can say like, I'm done having to work on this because I'm now anti-racist. You know, it's something, it's not something that just comes up in intense conversations with people who disagree. Um, it's about constant reflection, constant education, um, being transparent when you fall short. And it's also something that requires accountability and a network of people who are doing the work with you. So 
in posting these screenshot and respond graphics, people were able to see the vulnerability of others and were encouraged to join in uh, because they weren't alone in the journey. So our goal was to reframe the mind of our attendees when it comes to accountability and being anti-racist uh, and to remind everyone that it's an ongoing journey that we as a community will have to work towards together. So. All that being said, I was also very aware that this is a very sensitive and personal subject. And, um, you know, some people might not feel comfortable talking openly um, about their process in, you know, unlearning these kinds of things on social media. So um, no matter how hard we try to normalize being transparent and honest about the journey, there is always that uncertainty. So I wasn't sure how the response would be, but... Luckily, the momentum of the event continued onto social media, and we were blown away by the response. Um, over 574 screenshot and response graphics were shared, which, based on our follower account at the time, resulted in a 61% engagement rate, which was huge for us. So not only did news about our organization and the work that we're doing get, um, it got to be spreading further than we could have done on our own, but we also had 574 extremely personal reflections about what resonated most with them from our event. And, you know, we had tangible proof that our attendees were walking away with the tools that they needed to begin their anti-racist work. So that was extremely valuable for us. Um, now, another thing, um, I also recognize that Instagram story highlights contributed to this really high engagement rate. Uh, we found that stories that were included in an Instagram story highlight received an average of 25% more impressions than content that was just up for 24 hours. So this feature is super valuable for you to use, and it allows for content like this to be evergreen. So to this day, we still have these screenshot and response graphics up on our Instagram story highlights. Uh, and so it allows anyone to engage at any time, in addition to the concentrated bursts that happen within those first 24 hours of, of it being posted. So um, we had some big names like Ben Platt and Ingrid Michelson, uh, Beanie Feldstein. We had Katrina Link, Kayla Settle, and Casey Levy participate, um, which was really great for the number of impressions um, and you know allowed us to reach this larger audience. And also, it was just fun for me personally. Um, but most importantly for us as an organization, numbers aside we were able to provide people with a way to reflect personally, and we got a chance to encourage others to take this journey towards an anti-racist theater community with us. So based on this experience, I have three takeaways for you. Um, number one, people want to know that they're not the only ones attending something. You know, um, I think back to way back in the days in 2019 when we'd go to parties and events, um, if I got, invited to a Facebook event, I immediately checked the invite list to see if my friends were going. I don't know if any of you guys did too. Um, but we as humans have this inherent need to be involved in what everyone else is doing. And we want to know we're not alone. So um, make it easy for people to know before they even log into your event that, you know, this is something that other people are excited about and are attending. Number two, uh, especially when it comes to causes that people care about, people want a way to represent themselves as a supporter of that cause. So if your organization and what you do resonates with people, they're going to want to share about it. Um, it's all about you taking a step back and saying, like, what is the heart of this event? Why, why should people tune in? And so once you figure that out, um, there's a next step to take this to the next level. Um, and that's uh, when you give them that opportunity to share what they believe in, make sure to personalize the message for them. So notice we didn't say, I'm attending Broadway for Black Lives Matter again. We said, I'm ready to heal with my community and I'm ready to listen and stay accountable. So these were statements about the person that tied into the event rather than the other way around. Um, you know, it being a statement about the event that ties the person and their interests and values in. So it's always more relatable when you can let your audience make a statement about who they are through the lens of what your organization can offer. So then 
Number three, using these techniques, um, you can collect valuable information at every stage of your campaign, not just at the end. So, um, for example, we recently used um, our RSVP graphic strategy for a day of healing event that was just for black, cis, and trans women. And so everyone who posted that graphic on their story was added to our close friends list, um, which if you're in, unfamiliar, that's a feature of Instagram that allows you to share Instagram stories with a smaller subset of your audience, up to 100 people. So in doing this, we had a way to get content, direct, content directly to them in this personalized way for weeks after the event had ended. Um, so whether you use these tactics to track RSVPs for an estimated attendance or to identify groups of people you can tap into later, to get feedback and hear takeaways about what resonates most with your audience or to just spread the word, all of this information is super valuable to you and your organization as you continue programming. You know, you can take this and utilize it um, in planning future events, allowing you to get better at spreading the word and learning how your audience, um, you know, best, best can act as those advocates for you. Um, yeah, so brand ambassadors are, in my opinion, the most powerful thing that your organization can mobilize. Um, so if you're able to give people specific instructions on how to spread the word about something that they care about, um, they, they typically will. So um, that's all that I have for you today. Thank you so much for listening. And uh, thank you to the people working on captioning and ASL translation and all of that. Um, and then if anyone's interested, um, Broad Broadway Advocacy Coalition is continuing to host forums about anti-racism within the theater community. So um, I encourage all of you to join our future events. Thank you, Michaela. That was incredible. And um, the events that Michaela was talking about, the forums from this June are on, as, as she mentioned, on YouTube and were just incredibly powerful and incredibly informative and really, really moving. And if you, if you haven't seen them, uh, you may want to check those out. Next up, we have Antonio Davis Jr., who serves as the digital marketing and content manager at First Stage, which is a children's theater in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. We wanted to showcase the work of all kinds of organizations to show how people are using their creativity to work through constraints on budgets and resources. I'm very excited to introduce Antonio. Hi there. Hi, Eric. Hi, everyone. Ahoy. As uh, Eric mentioned, my name is Antonio Davis. I am a black male with a bald head and I'm wearing a bluish grayish sweater with a white button up. My pronouns are he, him, and I'm being broadcast from the native lands of Potawatomi, Ho-Chunk, and Menominee. Milwaukee, the good land of beer, cheese, MVPs like Milwaukee Bucks Ford, Giannis Antetokounmpo, and one of America's most vibrant art ecosystems. One organization that makes up this ecosystem is First Stage, housed in the Milwaukee Youth Art Center and the Marcus Performing Arts Center. First Stage is an arts and culture teaching institution made up of three pillars, theater productions, theater academy, and theater and education. It's where young people are central to the world of performing arts as it is an affiliate of Theater for Young Audience USA. And it's where I serve as a digital marketing manager, bringing forth content innovation alongside a small and mighty team. In a normal performance season, First Stage operates off of a $5 million budget. This year, our organization's budget has been cut by 50%. According to the National Assembly of State Art Agencies, Wisconsin spends less per capita on arts programming than any other state in this country. With that said, this is how we're continuing to bring forth content innovation in the new at normal. Kids to Kid is a scholarship program to bring more students to our theater academy. Unlike past years where funds were raised in the in-person bake sale, we ran a 10 week Instagram campaign over the summer which was 100% experiential, allowing us to use Instagram's donation features. This was a team effort between marketing, education, and development departments. 
and it was powered by student brand ambassadors, which was our first time employing such tactic. Let's break down the impact of the student driven campaign. The campaign raised $800 summer 2019. This year with first stages, spirit on full display and um, just everyone rally around this effort. We were able to raise $1,600, doubling impact and earning the ultimate incentive of lead teaching artist JT getting slimed. And I promise you, I'm only responsible of $60 of the funds raised. Let's turn our attention to Google Arts and Culture, which is a referral-based collaboration bringing 10 of First Stage's plays to its audience through immersive exhibits. One of these exhibits is Matilda the Musical, which is the first Broadway production to ever grace our stage. And this show ran in 2018-19 season. Milwaukee is the second US city to be a part of this global initiative. And it even made Google's search homepage. And it was even picked up by local media outlets like Milwaukee Magazine. Featured in the following trailer is our advanced acting students. It's gonna be tough for a lot of people and especially now more than ever. We have to stand up and make a change. I don't wanna be quiet. This is what motivates me. It's, this piece is giving the message of taking accountability of your actions. And I think in particular, it embraces the culture because we will not sit idly by. It gives a great example of what we need to accomplish as a community and as a people. If you stand to witness it, you done seen something. My name is Zoe Plunkett. I am Lucy Halpern. My name is Isaiah Martin. My name is Ailey Snyder. My name is Samika Sebastian. My name is Najee Robinson. I'm Lola Honorado. My name is Abigail Wallace. My name is Jonathan Nervous. I'm Maggie Stubb. Laura Allison. My name is Abby Hanna. My name is Anne Joseph Douglas. My name is Njamie Kamara, and I have had the honor and privilege of directing these young actors. And I'm so happy to share with you what they've developed. Our YP showcase in connection with the first Milwaukee Black Theater Festival was exceptional as it was timely, worthy, and historic events as well as content. This showcase was one of our is one of our most popular YouTube videos with over 400 plus views. I remember is a play on nostalgia, highlighting fans' comments from previous Throwback Thursday posts. Um, it's an experiential effort attempting to elevate the TBT trend, further engage with our audience and humanize our brand. To date, our most popular I Remember post is from Shrek the Musical 2013-14 season. Diving in deeper into the post insights, it has over 1300 impressions, 13 profile visits, and it even made Instagrams explore. The future is here. During this performance season, we're making YouTube more of a priority with the goals of enticing more people to see the viable career options theater has to offer behind the stage. Secondly, uh, we plan to become a YouTube partner within a year by reaching 1K subs and 4K watch hours. By becoming a YouTube partner, it will allow us to monetize our channel. We plan to achieve these goals with behind behind the scenes a YouTube series yet to roll out, focusing on the many layers theater, the, the theater industry has to offer. For example, prop design, scenic design, and carpentry. Before I close with the blooper reel, I'll give you these three takeaways. Rely on your ideals. It's your mustard seed. Leverage collaboration. It's your content's heartbeat. Be experiential. It's your organization's journey to innovation. Thank you. Uh, there I'm supposed to like. <laughs> and I go like that. And like, what? Wait, what do I say? Remoto? 
gonna start this over again. Uh, one more time. Give me a And then I look like this guy. In the background. I'm sure it was chopping. Oh, yes. Yeah. Alright. That was going so okay. This is good. I'm really glad you guys gave me something. <laughs> I think that may have been missed. Do we, do we answer all of the questions? And <laughs> Thank you, Antonio. We will see you at the Q and A, and we're going from Milwaukee to Minneapolis, staying in the Midwest. Our final social case study comes from the team at Minnesota Orchestra. Jen Kivi is the director of marketing. Isaac Rizzu uh, is the social media and content manager, and Grant Meacham is the director of Live at Orchestra Hall. And the three of them will share how they've evolved their social media efforts during this turbulent year. Take it away, Jen. Thank you so much, Eric, and hello, everyone. Thrilled to be with all of you today. As Eric mentioned, I'm Jen Keevey, director of marketing at the Minnesota Orchestra. My pronouns are she, her, and hers. I'm a white 40 something female with brown hair and glasses. I'm wearing big headphones and I'm also wearing a black turtleneck with little flowers on it. My colleagues and I live and work on the land of the Dakota people, land stolen by the US government in 1805. And eight miles from where I sit here in Minneapolis, the Minnesota, the Minnesota River joins the Mississippi River at a place called Bedote. This is a sacred site, and it's the center of the world to the Dakota. So to start, let's go back, way back to March 13th. It feels like a lifetime ago, doesn't it? Like all of you, our normal business operations suddenly became completely abnormal around that date. I remember thinking, ah, oh, this is just a small blip. It's going to be over. We're going to be back to normal by early April. And yet here we are entering our eighth month without audiences in Orchestra Hall, which you're seeing here in some drone footage. So despite the circumstances though, we have found ways to meet our audiences where they are now. And frankly, where some of them will continue to be post pandemic. Our recent success is rooted in our organizational culture where collaboration is at the heart of everything that we do. Now, some of you may be familiar with the Minnesota Orchestra's labor dispute of 2013. This was a painful and pivotal moment in our nearly 120 year history, but we came out the other side with a renewed sense of purpose and a deeper appreciation of the joy of sharing music. The rebuilding required was no small feat and it required a new way of operating our organization. And in this new way of thinking, Every stakeholder takes ownership to ensure the joyful relationship between artists and audiences. The thought is, is that, that if, if everyone has a seat at the table, then everyone is more invested in the audience benefits. And we call this the Minnesota model. So March 13th was the start of yet another new chapter in our history. That night, our mighty Minnesota Orchestra performed to an empty orchestra hall and thousands of radio listeners across Minnesota. The image you see here is from that night. And although the seats were empty, our musicians played with their whole hearts and Minnesota Public Radio's listeners felt every moment. This historic broadcast proved that our audience needed music now more than ever. And it was the catalyst for us to think differently about how we could share music in a pandemic. And the result was a new digital content hub called Minnesota Orchestra at home. This new way of sharing our music making required us to think like a media organization. And it was a huge effort to get off the ground. From concept to execution, we launched within one week. After the launch, we quickly made some adjustments to our website to shift the focus away from ticket sales and toward digital content delivery, as you see here in the before and after. So on the left, you'll see what our site looked like BC before COVID and what it looked like when we launched Minnesota or, or shortly after we launched Minnesota Orchestra at home. So let's be honest, 
We built the plane while we were flying it. Um, we're still building that plane as we fly, uh, which meant that we've had uh, to fine tune things along the way as we did here with our website. Our quick launch was aided by the work of the Communications Council. And this is a cross-departmental group of colleagues from marketing, communications, development, artistic, and education uh, that meets every Monday morning. So this working group ensures we're understanding, we have understanding across departments around the organizational communications and content priorities, a holistic view of our customer and our storytelling efforts, alignment on institutional messaging, and the ability to be responsive to audience needs. So from an institutional messaging standpoint, we all felt strongly early on that it was important for us to share messaging that came from a place of abundance and community, not scarcity. And that theme has carried through with everything we've done throughout the pandemic. I firmly believe that part of our ability to pivot quickly and keep front of mind with our community was rooted in the following things. Our organizational culture, our consistent focus around what can we positively do despite the obstacles and restrictions of the pandemic, our sustained messaging around gratitude and abundance. And I just have to say, we have an amazing team. So from mid-March to early October, you can see the results of our efforts here on this next slide. So across social media platforms, we've had more than 13 million impressions, nearly 600,000 engagements, a total audience size of 97,000, that's enough to fill Orchestra Hall almost 50 times, 46,000 link clicks, and more than 2 million video views across platforms. And my colleague Isaac is gonna dig in a little bit more on some engagement stats during his portion of our talk. On the revenue side of things, all of this work to keep our audience engaged during our extended intermission has really truly paid off. So in August, we kicked off a successful gift certificate promotion that generated almost 200,000 in sales. And of the several thousand households whose concerts were canceled or rescheduled from March through the end of this calendar year, only 8% have requested refunds. Almost 20% have turned their tickets back to us as donations. Nearly 50% have put their money toward this current season and tickets, gift certificates, and some have even put a deposit on next season. And on the fundraising side, we've seen a 50% increase in contributed revenue. And the number of online gifts has increased or it increased by 111% compared to fiscal 19. So what are we doing now? Uh, we've entered a new phase in our digital music making and sharing, a concert series for TV, radio, and streaming through our new partnership with Twin Cities PBS and our longtime partners and friends at Minnesota Public Radio. To close, I think it's safe to say that none of us imagined the impact that this virus would have on our community, our music making, and our day-to-day -day work. But the pandemic has reiterated for us that our organizational values and culture have helped position us well for this moment and beyond. And now I'm going to turn things over to my colleague, Isaac. He's going to share more specifics around the content we created as well as engagement metrics. Thanks, Jen. Uh, so my name is Isaac Rizzo. My pronouns are he, him, his. I'm a 30-year-old cis white male with a shaved head, glasses, and a short beard wearing a black shirt today. The centerpiece of our Minnesota Orchestra at Home campaign was a series of at-home performances from our musicians. It all started with a brass quintet arrangement of This Little Light of Mine. The Always Up For Anything brass ensemble led the way and recorded this physically distant performance from the back of their cars in a parking lot last March. Let's take a look.
The response was immediate. With nearly 250,000 views in the first weekend, this video spoke to the emotions of the moment. It showed all this in the organization that we could continue, continue to connect with our audience online through our new Minnesota Orchestra at Home campaign. So here's a look of all, uh, most of the content we've created since March, and it makes me exhausted just looking at it. The pandemic turned the spotlight from our stage to our website and social media. The entire organization jumped in with ideas on how to connect with our community online. And to be honest, it was all a little overwhelming and unorganized, and I'm sure many of you can relate. We eventually established new systems in which leaders from musician, artistic, and staff departments prioritized projects and helped identify the strongest opportunities. Everyone stepped up to create content in three categories of watch, listen, and learn. Since March, orchestra musicians have created more than 70 of those at-home performances. Our content marketing group worked with our artistic colleagues and musicians to generate content ideas that were timely and relevant to our community, focused on life moments. One of those life moment projects was a compilation video of the orchestra performing Pomp and Circumstance. About 1,000 users downloaded the clip for use in commencement ceremonies in nearly all 50 states, as well as 10 countries. The Education and Community, community Engagement Department created several fun and educational activities for kids and families like Make Your Own Instruments, Spotify playlists that encourage children to explore their emotions through music, yoga and meditation techniques, and more. In addition, the team worked with musicians to create several resources for student musicians. Practice with the Pro video tutorials and duets, uh, which allowed students to play along with our musicians, and we provided the sheet music for download. A big shout out to the team who made this happen. Our tireless video producer, designers and writers, editors, website pros and project managers created compelling content experiences in record time in a new work from home environment. We did all of this without creating, uh, increasing our post frequency. With about five posts per week, our engagement rate since March has been 5.4% across all platforms with over 800 engagements per post. That's compared to a 1.7% engagement rate in 2019 with 195 engagements per post. Our ongoing connection to the musicians is through a new social media committee. Six musicians collaborate with marketing and communication staff regularly to brainstorm and execute ideas that increase musician involvement in our content creation. Musicians from this committee led Instagram takeovers and Instagram live performance initiatives, generated ideas for video projects and gathered photos for social posts. Their advocacy for the importance of social media to connect with their audience also inspired the creation of this uh, social media guide that you're seeing on your screen that includes tips for beginners to super users. So what's next? Uh, as Jen mentioned, the Minnesota Orchestra is back on stage this fall with concerts presented on TV, radio, and streaming. Uh, we have some photos here of the behind the scenes of our first concert broadcast in September from the control room to the stage. These performance live streams on social media bring a whole new level of engagement to our concerts. And the collaboration continues with our musicians on the committee, helping to create content that helps us stay connected to our digital audience. So the takeaway here is that our forced move to digital content highlighted the opportunities available when we work together. I feel more connected to these incredible artists than ever. And I think they have a new appreciation for the power and importance of digital content. Shared ownership of content ideation and creation is now a proven model for our success. And I can't wait to see how we keep increasing our engagement with our audience online. So now I'm gonna turn it over to my colleague Grant to share how we went about creating some of our signature projects with musicians and artistic partners. Thanks, Isaac. Thank you, Jen. My name is Grant Meacham. My pronouns are he, him, and his. I'm a 41-year-old cis white male with brown hair and a short beard. I'm wearing a thick black sweater because it is 31 degrees and snowing in Minneapolis today. I say this with great love for the city. I moved to Minneapolis from New York City in 2015, and I honestly believe there's something special about this city and about the Minnesota Orchestra. And I think what really sets this orchestra apart is the Minnesota model that Jen talked about earlier, a dedication to collaboration. And it's this collaborative spirit that's allowed us to be thoughtful and nimble about developing new ways to engage with our audiences virtually. I will say at the outset, uh, we were not the first orchestra to create virtual performances. Uh, notably, the Colorado Symphony and the Toronto Symphony were out ahead of everyone else in a wonderful way. 
But what we learned from their success is there's a need for orchestras to create and share content with audiences while we aren't performing live. But we knew that if we were going to create something virtual, it needed to have an original concept and lean into the Minnesota model as our guide. So in that spirit, our first virtual project was initiated by an idea from musicians within the orchestra. We as an orchestra have built some great relationships with local musicians from outside the classical world. The thought was, let's partner with one of these artists for a big splashy crossover. Now our highest profile partner is the rapper, Dessa. We've done six performances together, we released an album together last November, and we're always looking for the next big project. A flurry of text messages later, Dessa was game to work with us on a virtual performance of one of her pieces. So we had a project that developed over a series of Zoom calls with the orchestra staff, musicians, and team Dessa, and through these we built an artistic idea. The prevailing aesthetic from all these other virtual orchestra projects has been everyone on the screen in blocks, sort of like the Brady Bunch, and for very good reason, it's clean, it's easy on the eye, and we wanted to take this baseline of a look and put our own spin on it. We also wanted to openly acknowledge the fact that we're all quarantined at home. Kids, pets, homemade percussion, and a very prominent shower curtain are at the heart of the video. We also came up with, uh, as Jen said, building the plane while we were flying it, came up with a method to sync the audio and video made in 40 different homes and mix it into a seamless artistic product, and thus was born Skeleton Key Lockdown Edition. The one-year-old on drums gets me every time. Um, we released this video on May 10th. We got about 20,000 online views in the first 24 hours and got thousands more TV viewers because we got a huge premiere on Mother's Day evening on a TV special on our local Fox station. So our first collaborative video project was a success. We engaged audiences while highlighting the orchestra's dedication to collaboration across media and across artistic specialties. It really felt like a moment of catharsis at a time when we really all needed a distraction from this worsening health crisis. But now we were deeper into lockdown. There was no end in sight. May 11th, and we needed a new innovative idea to build on this momentum. And to give you an idea of just how high up this collaborative spirit runs, the next big idea came directly from the top, our music director, Osmo Vanska. Now, Osmo is also the music director of the Seoul Philharmonic. And at the time he pitched this idea, restrictions were lifted in Korea to the point that Osmo could have a masked, socially distanced orchestra with him on stage. So to take advantage of this, Osmo proposed recording a piece with his full orchestra in Seoul and then layering in virtual performances from our musicians in Minnesota. The piece that we chose was the Nimrod movement from Edward Elgar's Enigma Variations. It's a musical reflection of somber times mixed with a feeling of hope. Isaac noted before just how up for anything our musicians are. And in this case, they jumped in immediately and some special challenges we as a group set out to solve. First of all, how do we sync not only 40 individual performances, but one group performance, which are made 6,000 miles away from each other? How do we mix the audio to accommodate a slow, soft entrance that builds to a big, loud finale without blowing out the speakers on your laptop? And how do we accommodate things like different tuning? Not to get to too inside baseball here, but in Seoul, they tuned to A442. In Minnesota, we tuned to A440. These do not work on top of each other, so we made adjustments to match. For this, I have to give a big shout out again to our tireless video and audio team to make all of this work. Visually, here we had another step of departure from the everyone in blocks aesthetic. We asked our Minnesota musicians to record facing the same direction they would face on stage. For instance, a cellist you would see in profile as opposed to straight on. What this allowed us to do was to create a layering effect that said we're still an ensemble, even if we're not on stage altogether. Another point of engagement and a positive online reaction, but now we're working in a changing world. When we conceived this Nimrod project, COVID-19 was the crisis that we were spending the bulk of our organizational resources addressing. And then on May 25th, George Floyd was murdered four miles from Orchestra Hall. 
I'll give a warning. This is still a very difficult thing for me to talk about. Um, what you're going to see on screen here are images from our musical response, which I'll talk about in a moment, as well as footage taken by one of our staff photographers from the peaceful protests in South Minneapolis in the days following the murder. This was an event that rocked our community and the entire country. It brought a sharp and immediate focus to the injustice that pervades our society, and it caused us to assess the role that we have, individually, collective, and as an arts organization, to address this at the very core of our activities and our mission. In the immediacy of the moment, our musicians elected to offer a somber musical response in the form of a Shostakovich string quartet. It was important to present this as an acknowledgement that we, the Minnesota Orchestra, are a part of this community and share in the collective grief, while still recognizing that there's a lot of challenging work ahead for our orchestra and our industry to reduce our reliance on and reproduction of white privilege. It's a project that was conceived, recorded, and posted in a span of four days. And this was the first time our musicians had formed something together in the same room since March 13th. Three very different projects and all very successful by the metrics that Jen and Isaac talked about earlier. So what contributed to this success? I think there were two things. The first was a centrality of purpose throughout the organization. And that purpose was finding a way to use our limited resources to create an artistic statement that shows what makes the Minnesota Orchestra unique. There was also a mutual trust in our colleagues. It just felt very Minnesotan, and I mean that in the most loving possible way. We had to trust our musicians to find a way to make music under any circumstances, trust our tech and creative colleagues to make it look and sound beautiful, and trust each other to be supportive, to lift each other up when we're trying to figure out something while dealing with the uncertainty of our professional and personal lives. So we'll have a lot more virtual projects to be released. I'm gonna give a teaser in just a moment, but we're also, of course, working in a landscape that changes every day. And our focus for the fall has shifted towards broadcasts and live streams through our new partnership with Twin Cities PBS and the Minnesota Public Radio. We're gonna leave you today with a sneak peek of our latest video project featuring the pianist, John Kamura Parker. Jackie is our creative partner for Summer at Orchestra Hall, our new festival that was set to launch in July, 2020 and celebrate Beethoven's influence on music and society at large. This festival theme was postponed to summer 2021, but we're excited to share a small collaborative performance with our community this weekend. Thank you so much, everyone. Nice job, everybody. I'm gonna bring everybody back now. Nice job, Veronica. I mean, let's just give another shout out to Veronica and our ASL team, especially for our, um, we always, you know, talk. I think people, when we rehearse, I, I know I do this, I'll rehearse and it will be like 10 minutes and then I'll do my session and it'll be eight minutes and the poor ASL interpreter has to keep up. So thank you all so much. So um, lots of uh, great questions coming in and please add more questions to the chat. We actually have a, a little bit of time for uh, Q and A, which is awesome. And we saw three very different case studies, which was the point. So I'm really excited to uh, hear from all of you. Um, I think the first question I want to start with was um, around Minnesota and how you think of yourself as a media organization. And the question is wondering how that uh, affects staffing roles. For example, were production staff pulled in to help with digital efforts? Were marketing staff more involved in production than usual? I think one of the things that the pandemic did was blur some lines. And so uh, we'd love to hear about how, how that worked. And um, folks at Minnesota, or if Antonio or Michaela have thoughts about that, please feel free to uh, jump in as well. Yeah, I can I can start and then I'll lean on Grant and Isaac to chime in as well. So, you know, fortunately, we 
uh, have an in-house creative team. And on that team, we have a fabulous video producer, Frank, who just is always willing to do whatever it takes to get it done. Mm -hmm. um, and of course, we also have uh, audio engineers on staff as well, which is very critical, obviously, with, with an orchestra. Um, I really think, you know, we kind of had a mechanism in place already in terms of content planning um, and a content working team. The communications council I talked about is also a place where, you know, these ideas are sort of come up and then we're sort of fleshing them out as a smaller group. Um, and we also have a video planning team that gets together every couple of weeks. So I feel like we, we had the mechanism in place um, because of the work we were doing before the pandemic, but it was like we went from like zero to 60 <laughs> in March and had to just, you know, the volume was just so much more mm -hmm. and really having to stop and, and plan and sort of prioritize and really like be okay with, you know what, we can't take that on, that's, that's too much. I mean, we had more ideas than we could execute. Um, so I would say, we were already starting to think about things in that way, but the pandemic just sort of made that shift. You know, we really had to kind of kick it into gear. Um, in terms of artistic production team, and Grant can talk a little bit more about this, for the, the broadcast series that we're um, doing right now with Twin Cities PBS and NPR, um, our artistic production team is super involved in that um, now. So with the at-home videos, it was really our marketing communications team that was taking the lead on that content creation. Now that we're doing this broadcast series, it's really the production team, artistic production team, taking the lead on that. However, Frank and Isaac and Hannah, our creative director, are also involved in that. Um, so I would just say staffing-wise, roles didn't shift too much. Um, the, the one big shift maybe that happened was our single ticket marketing manager, her time really shifted to more brand awareness and promotion of the Minnesota Orchestra at Home series. And now she's working on promotion of the broadcast series. Isaac and, uh, and Grant, I don't know if you have anything you'd add to that. I, I will add that you know as my, my position as director of Live at Orchestra Hall means I, I used to spend most of my time in my natural habitat, which is producing large shows involving the Minnesota Orchestra. In a way, this was sort of habitat adjacent in that uh, it's not so much a big show with the orchestra on stage, it's just a different kind of big show, which is available virtually with you know all of us spread out in our homes across the metro. So it was learning a new vocabulary, but at the same time, it was bringing people of different specialties together to create something. Great. Um, Michaela, the next question was um, for you, asking the graphics that you showed, um, were these all in stories or were they also posts and talk about how you, how you think about that and how you executed that? Yeah, um, so they really just lived on Instagram stories. And again, uh, Instagram story highlights was a, a big piece of that. I think for one of them, the anti-racist, like what's your vision of an anti-racist and equitable theater community? That one, we did post something on main feed, um, but I didn't see like a ton of interaction. Really where we saw the most of it was on Instagram stories, which there, there are a ton of stats about how Instagram stories actually sometimes get a lot more impressions and more reach um, than main feed posts. So um, we noticed that it was leaning that way, so we just stuck with that instead of kind of clogging up the feed. And the follow-up question about uh, paid versus organic content. Um, did you supplement your uh, organic efforts with any paid promotion? We did not. It's all, all organic. Yeah. It was wonderful. Um, Antonio, I see you shaking your head. All of your uh, case studies were organic as well? Correct. Yeah. Um, yeah, that's why we um, that's why we wanted to do the the session yesterday, focused on organic content because we talk a lot about paid, but um, you know, organic is important too. Mm -hmm. um, there was a question in the chat about the gift certificate campaign. Um, eyes popping open with a two hundred and fifty thousand dollar campaign um, as a lot of organizations are starting to prepare for holiday gifting um, and given that many people still can't go back in person, uh, if you could talk about how, uh, what was, what was, what made that campaign so successful? Sure. So it was a little less successful. It was almost 200,000. So 
just to get that out there. Um, you know, in August, you know, we had every intention. We we were sort of going down this, you know, thought process of, yeah, we're going to be back. We're going to have audiences that might be, you know, we might not have a full hall, but we're going to have concerts um, and have audiences. And then things shifted a little bit. And we knew we had all of these folks with money on account um, from concerts that had been canceled or rescheduled. So that was part of the sort of rationale for doing it was, hey, we want those folks to keep their money with us. So we went out with the campaign to those folks. Um, I think part of the success was the creative for the campaign, which I'm happy to share. If anyone wants to reach out to me, I can share that uh, creative concept. Um, so the promotion was if you spend a hundred, if you, you know, buy a hundred dollar gift certificate, we'll give you $25 gift certificate for free and a limited edition Minnesota Orchestra t-shirt. And the theme was listen, play, gather, meaning, look, we're on this extended intermission, but we are coming back. So, you know, we're still going to listen and play, play and gather, you know, but just hang tight with us. It will happen. So I really think that messaging resonated, especially with our nearest and dearest. And I think the timing of it, you know, as we were, um, we were also doing some free concerts during the month of August because our concerts in the hall had been canceled and we wanted to do thank you concerts for folks who had stuck with us through the season. So we did a series of concerts outdoors, chamber concerts on PD Plaza outside of Orchestra Hall. Um, we had concerts every Sunday through well, wait, Sunday through Friday, maybe? I can't remember. Anyway, we were really engaging with those folks, and I feel like the whole idea of Listen, Play, Gather at that time really just worked. Um, I will say we've done a second round of promotion for this that's not performed as well, um, but we're taking a look at that and continuing to monitor it and sort of thinking about how will we change things up for the holidays with a similar campaign. Antonio, um, you shared a fundraising campaign that I understand the $800 was last year in person from a bake sale. And then um, you doubled that by doing a digital campaign this year. Um, what do you think uh, were the drivers behind the, the doubling of, of your results? I think our digital audience was able to get a deeper look at the first stage culture and how our young people really are central to the work that we do. And that was outpoured through our, really our brand ambassadors. I can't thank them enough. They took this on, they wanted this. Um, and in light with everything else was going on, they took this and put on their own um, showcase at the end of the, um, campaign, which was the night we raised the most funds. Great. Michaela, have you um, experimented much with uh, online fundraising? We haven't really done much of that on on like our platform. We've honestly, we've, we've gotten a lot of people who have been like, how can I donate and, you know, directed them to our website. But um, no, our, our focus has more been on with the resources that we currently have, um, you know, figuring out what kind of programming we can do moving forward, how we can, um, you know, help the, the directly affected communities and um, yeah, have been focused more on that. Um, but maybe in the future, you'll see it. Yeah. <laughs> I know I know your organization's done done well for fundraising because like I said yesterday to quote Clive Gillens and money follows vision and those, those were just such visionary events. And so I certainly, um, yeah, can imagine. Um, there was a question about the communication council meetings um, as well as union negotiations. So I think the communication council question is a real quick one. Who runs the communication council meetings? What's the structure agenda? And then if um, someone from the Minnesota Orchestra can talk about uh, how you overcame some of the union media agreements to have downloadable material. Isaac, do you want to take the communications council question? Yeah, that's led by our director of communications, um, Gwen, and we walk through everything that's going out that week, social media, press releases, any talking from the stage, just to make sure we're all on the same page. And then we plan our weekly email content and 
other major um, projects. So we make sure that we're all, um, if there's something coming up that we want to collaborate on, we're all working on that together. And if you'd like, Eric, I can field the union question. Great. Uh, for those in the orchestra world, we work within what's called the integrated media agreement. This is separate from an individual collective bargaining agreement that each orchestra has with their local union. The media agreement is industry wide, which you know, sort of standardizes the way orchestras approach media. We worked within what's called the promotional clause, wherein as long as we use the end footage in certain ways, notably that it's for promoting the orchestra in a certain way, then it is something that, that is done gratis uh, by musicians. But I will also say, even if that were not the case, the musicians of the Minnesota Orchestra, there is such a strong and collaborative relationship with management uh, that allows us to sort of come up with new ideas and try them out in real time, as long as everyone can agree this is in the best interests of the Minnesota Orchestra and our community. It's a really amazing place to get to make music. Absolutely. Anyone else have any thoughts on that? No. Um, let's see. The, um, there's a question that came in about the student-driven fundraising. Um, Antonio, was that fully student-led, or did uh, how did you interact with the the students on on that fundraising campaign? Yeah. Uh, so. In my presentation, um, pictured was Jonathan and Eloise. So Eloise was our head um, brand ambassador. And we uh, thought it was best that she forms um, the other, or bring in the other brand ambassadors. Um, definitely looking for diversity. Um, when we were assembling the team and she took on, she took on that and brought that together and brought that energy. We had a rollout piece of content that went before we launched uh, that following Monday. So this was in, in June, uh, June 15th. And we took it from there and um, she took on the first three weeks and then each brand ambassador rotated all the way up into those 10 weeks. Um, final question here that um, can be for, for everybody. Um, can any panelist or all panelists uh, comment on the struggle of working towards more diverse, inclusive programming and facing pushback from audience. We have a challenge of an older conservative demographic and find it a difficult tightrope to walk. I can chime in here. Um, yeah, there's, there's an approach that we at Broadway Advocacy Coalition have really um, clung on to, which I think can maybe help with this, um, this idea of calling in instead of calling out. Um, so instead of, you know, kind of putting people on blast of like, this is this awful, you know, thing that you've done, or you disagree with, you know, what we're saying here, and that's not okay, you know, kind of having um, uh, more of an approach of like, hey, let's have a conversation about this, like, let's um, dialogue and um, providing tools and resources and um, yeah, kind of like understanding that, you know, this is a, a difficult space and people are coming from different backgrounds, but um, you know, the more that you're able to not attack that allows the other person to, um, you know, hopefully not take more of a defensive uh, standpoint. So that's been something calling in instead of calling out has been something that we've really tried to implement. I love that. I, I can talk a little bit about at the Minnesota Orchestra. Um, there has been next to no pushback, which which is wonderful. But I will also say, just e even in a vacuum, it's it's our responsibility as an arts organization to program based on the world that we're living in. And I think even if there were pushback, we would the Minnesota Orchestra would find a nimble way to make sure we were still living up to this responsibility uh, that we have. I think it it starts with values and knowing that your value, who your what your values are and all of your marketing and fundraising and programming and everything that you do comes from those values. And, um, you know, if, if people, if you live your values and your values are around diversity and inclusion and, and people are not liking that, well, perhaps they should find a different organization. And, and as a codicil to that, we had a former music director who said there, there's two kinds of music, good and bad. And the Minnesota Orchestra is playing good music um, and we're diversifying the good music that we're playing. and and. For that reason, even with minimal pushback, we can move beyond that and say we are doing our, our duty as an arts organization in the year 2020. Anyone else have anything to add? 
Yeah, I, I would say um, to me, um, generation is is a construct. It's really about the commonality. So with what's presented um, in this case, in this um, COVID era world was presented through digital. And we always are trying to find that um, commonality. And we are a young people, family oriented theater. And so we're always trying to strike that balance and we do a great job at it. Wonderful, I agree. Well, Michaela, Grant, Isaac, Jen, Antonio, I can't thank you enough. Thank you, Mike, for your ASL interpretation. And um, we will see you back um, in, let's see, we are going to a break. So we're back in five minutes and um, we're going to have a Tony Award winner, Nikki M. James, join us for a performance at the top of the next session. And the top of the next session is Access in the Arts. You won't want to miss the performance. You won't want to miss the presentation. We will see you in five. Thank you. <laughs>